As part of a project documenting the early years of the Experimental Psychology Society, I'm here with Bob Audley. Bob, thank you very much for your time. I wonder if you could begin by telling us about your early experiences that led you to pursuing a career in psychology. At school, I certainly had, I don't think I'd ever heard of psychology. And um, of course, uh, during the war, I mean, I'd, uh, I was joining a grammar school in 1939, just as the war began. So uh, it was Battersea Grammar School. But they actually went to Worthing. That's where they were evacuated. That's where I joined them. So I was in Worthing. Um, when German aeroplanes flew over Worthing, which had apparently not been anticipated by uh, the powers that be, they decided they'd better ship us off. So we went to uh, Hartford and... Then I ended up in the servants' quarters of a, a local squire, which is quite, quite good. Um, and so, anyway, my main interests were in... You know, I had fairly broad interests, but I was gradually edging towards maths and physics. And I suppose by the time I was coming to the equivalent of A-levels, I was either thinking of physics... Or I was quite interested in um, naval architecture, and I had thought that I might go into that. So I did um, uh, extra uh, courses in um, engineering drawing and so on, which was rather fun. Anyway, come uh, 1947, yes, uh, I'm called up for my military service. And uh, when everybody was celebrating in London the um, uh, marriage of uh, Princess Margaret, uh, Princess Elizabeth, uh, I was on a train going to Maidstone to the barracks there for my <laughs> training. Uh, so um, as my father had been in the engineers, and he was in Africa at the, at the time in the war, um, uh, I joined the Royal Engineers, and after a very weird training, which I won't go into, um, eventually found myself in Germany in the headquarters uh, there, and I had a very enjoyable time. During that period, I, I at school I'd been taught German with a slipper, and uh, uh, French with a cane, it was um, these advanced... <laughs> methods of the time <laughs> and uh, uh, so while I was there I I, I, um, I don't know why I, I, I always read very widely but I, I came across a, a little book by a Frenchman been translated uh, I think he was a, a physiologist rather than psychologist Henri Piron um, and um, in it uh, he introduced uh, Weber and Fechner and so on. And I thought, yeah, fantastic. You know, here's, uh, here you are relating uh, physical events to psychological events. Fantastic. And, uh, and then I, I thought, as I, uh, uh, when I was doing physics and so on, I, th I couldn't imagine what you would do as a physicist if you weren't Einstein or, or Newton. I mean... I mean, now I, I see I could have approached it a different way, but at the time, that seemed beyond me. So I, um, I, I, it was possible in those days to get leave to pop over to uh, uh, England for advice on university places and so on, which is you know, very generous, really. So I, I got an appointment to see uh, Professor Mace, um, who... Uh, was in Birkbeck College, and that time they were just off uh, off the Strand somewhere. And I know, I went into this building with... Uh, um, it, it It was a bomb-damaged building, and when I was in his... He, went, he was on the first floor, and it was cantilevered, so you know, as you walked across the room, it moved up and down. It's really quite a challenge. So he, he anyway, he said, oh, you want to do psychology? Oh, well, you must go to university college then. Um, I didn't argue about that. So then I got an appointment to, to um, see a Dr. Philpott, 
at the university college and I, you know, uh, I, I pressed my uniform and tried to look as smart as possible. And I anticipated maybe uh, stress interviews or something like that. And when I, I uh, found Phil Pott, he said, oh, you're orderly. I understand you're joining us next term. So that is a big contrast, I think, to modern <laughs> selection. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I, I came there. And as I, as I said, the class then was made up of, um, uh, I think, about half school leavers and half uh, ex-service. And um, uh, I, I don't know what other people intended to do. I didn't actually have a particular career intention when I went there. I just, as I was, uh, I was seduced by Weber Fechner, I suppose, <laughs> a strange reason. It was much easier being a student in many ways then, <coughs> I think, because um, we ex-service people have better, better grants than state scholars, who were the others there mostly. And uh, I think uh, it was fairly natural that, that we ex-service people tended to be together. So two of us who were ex-army and two ex-navy got together and we had a flat uh, in the basement in uh, Notting Hill Gate. Um, uh, and we, uh, that's how we started then. And um, uh, the psychology at UC it was quite well balanced across a range of topics. Um, and I, I can show you uh, the, the um, exam papers for my year to give you an idea of that, what we had to do. Um, but uh, uh, in those days, although you had sessional exams, you, you only took an exam at the end of your three years. Um, and it was, a, it was a, a, a special degree which you could take in arts or science. And if you did science, you usually did a two-year subsidiary degree. And so I did mine in statistics, which was a good choice because we had uh, E.S. Pearson, who was the head of the department then. And uh, so uh, uh, we really got to know our stats very well. And um, I was taught probability theory by um, Florence Nightingale David, who was a, a rather... For, uh, a descendant of uh, Florence Nightingale, who um, was a fairly ferocious person, but uh, you, know, you you really got down to uh, essences there. And we did wonderful practical exams. I remember, um, like given the given the probability of winning a uh, point at tennis when you are serving, and the probability of winning a point when you are receiving. Um, calculate the probability of winning a match. And um, then you had to do this for uh, a matrix of probabilities. So, and, uh, of course, in those days, there were no um, um, point breaks or whatever it's called now, uh, you know, the, to shorten the... And you could go on forever to infinity for someone, so you had to sum series as well. And in those days, you must think of uh, the computers which were hand-operated and not particularly uh, elaborate. And if you're, even a few of you working your way, you can just imagine the din of all this real there. But it, in fact, it was very good for us, I think, so we got an idea of um, uh, computing data in a big way. One remarkable thing was that in the final exam, there were two practicals. One was a two experiments in six hours, and the other one was one experiment in six hours. And, uh, you know, you were literally doing these exams. Um, and we, the, the day, uh, 1952, it was one of these great heat waves, and we were doing our exam in a... Um, in an engineering drawing office. So with temperatures around about 100 Fahrenheit, uh, streaming through a glass roof, it was pretty steamy work. You know? And we were, we were allowed to get down to our, uh, our singlets, and we were allowed to drink beer and have sandwiches during the course of it. So 
but you know our, our exam papers were literally with splodges of uh, sweat naturally enough so I, I remember that yeah, very well um, we also we we also did a project in the final year there and um, we we had a rather good program of uh, inviting uh, speakers um, there and we were very fortunate to have had both Luria one year and then we had Heb just shortly after he'd published The Organisation of Behaviour. And so uh, I remember uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Ken Corkindale, later became uh, the senior psychologist in the Navy. He and I did a, an experiment based on eye movements and shape perception, which was meant to be a, a, um, a, 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 a in some weird way, a test of Heb's notions. I can't remember more. <laughs> um, and um, and I remember uh, us being very perplexed uh, with in Hebb's theories uh, of how you could see two of the same thing. So I asked him about that, and um, he didn't really give me an answer that satisfied me. I suppose, um, but uh, obviously Hebb had a um, very big impact on many um, well, on many psychologists in this country at the time. Um, the other thing, the other thing is that during our first two years, the head of department was Cyril Burt, um, who was, in some sense, the, the doyen of psychologists, and uh, uh, of course he was the uh, great villain for other people. But he was quite a remarkable man, and um, he, he would always lecture wearing a, a white medical, a sort of um, short white medical jacket, and he would he would rehearse his lecture for about an hour before coming in. And they were really a uh, tour de force. And they were really uh, fantastic. They might involve, you know, um, illustrating the arpeggio paradox of you know, problems in identifying a particular note when it's in a sequence, go over to a piano, which we conveniently had, and play the piano. <laughs> and um, and uh, the other thing is that Practically every subject he touched on had a, uh, could be uh, summarised by a two-by-two two table. You know, it was, I don't know. For all the different theories of mind, it always worked out that way. I can't recall all of them. Uh, if I could let my aged brain wait a while, they, they might come back to me. Um, but... Uh, uh, and... Another, an, an, uh, there was Phil Pot, who was one of the lecturers, but for for subsidiary elements, uh, for for um, uh, sort of specialised elements, uh, other speakers dealt with it. For example, um, I, uh, I think was doing the uh, uh, personality and abnormal. We had a chap called Max Hamilton, who was a uh, uh, physiologist doing the physiology stuff. So we had. Um, uh, they were pretty good in their work. Uh, and, of course, the other thing at, 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 at UC is it was fairly strong in uh, developmental psychology as well as anything else because um, uh, Bert had established a, um, a diploma in educational psychology. I, I think it was the first uh, uh, for, and perhaps the only one for quite a time. But uh, Bert retired in 19, at the end of 1951. So in, uh, so from September 51 to 52, a new professor came in. And um, that was uh, Roger Russell, who was an American. I forget from which, which department he came, but he was certain, I think he'd been a student of Hunter, and uh, also knew, um, I can't think of the name of the chap, who was had a textbook in comparative psychology, Munn, that's right, um, which uh, was fairly influential. Um, and um, 
Russell himself was essentially um, a, a, an animal psychologist, but he was particularly interested in, um, at that time, in the role of various neurotransmitters. So, you know, be, behind his work was the idea of um, um, uh, trying to find out experiments to determine how neurotransmitters operated through behavioural studies. And uh, he had been at the Maudsley, which is where um, uh, Ising was. Uh, Ising, of course, had, had come up through UC um, and was sort of translating Burt's stuff on intelligence um, uh, uh, into uh, similar... Um, correlational analyses of personality. So that, there was always that link between UC um, and um, the Institute of Psychiatry, but in, um, and it's sometimes hostile, it was quite complicated. Um, so then, uh, during that year, uh, I, 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 I should explain that I'm going into too much detail now, but somehow one can't help it. Um, that there are several colleges in London, University College being just one of them, and there were also departments at um, Birkbeck uh, and at uh, Bedford. Not quite sure whether there were any others at that time. Um, can't quite recall, but that's... Uh, and the thing was that the, the final exam paper uh, was really uh, joint for all these colleges. So the, the various uh, 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 lecturers and other uh, teaching staff got together and uh, prepared papers which reflected the differences in the courses because they taught different courses, really, um, to a common general syllabus. And... Um, so your exam, sometimes you'd see on your exam paper some things you'd never ever heard of, you know. And, uh, so, but anyway, there were enough questions to make that reasonable. Uh, but the great thing was, because they did these things in the final year, I must say during, uh, during my uh, first two years, I spent more time on uh, my um, stats than I did on psychology. And uh, so I was rather lucky uh, that uh, um, a new professor had come in, so the, the questions had a different shape. And I was very lucky in my final year, we, uh, with the new professor, we had new staff coming in. And amongst them uh, was um, uh, P.H.R. James, uh, who, uh, he is a Cambridge uh, graduate, but I, I can't remember whether he'd gone to Yale or Harvard, and that's where he'd been. And so, um, you know, he, he was um, very much in contact with latest developments um, in, in America, and um, and that that helped a lot, you know, because he he really stimulated one's interest, well, mine in in psychology. And um, so I, I did quite well, I think, because I was amongst the few people who had relatively little negative transfer from uh, first year to first, second year to the final one. Uh, but, uh, and the other thing is I remember in the first year uh, that another chap taking stats, uh, somebody called John Newson, who was later a professor at uh, uh, Nottingham, uh, came, he and his wife, um, who was also there, uh, and later were joint professors at, um, at Nottingham. Um, he and I did a... Uh, uh, Philpot had a really weird theory about uh, uh, output of, uh, uh, on any task, uh, reflecting fluctuations in, in... I'm not quite sure what they were, but whether it was attention, but... Uh, um, processes that contributed to the task. 
and um, so he used to take samples of work and then uh, he would go I think there were tables in the, in the Kendall stats um, monographs about breaking down patterns into their components and he wasn't using any sophisticated way. He almost sort of was doing it visually, I think. I don't know. Anyway, he had this theory of uh, fluctuations in output. Um, and somehow or other, uh, in ways I never could I quite understand, they all seem to come back to a zero point of Planck's constant, which is you know, taking your psychology a bit far, really. And... Um, so a nuisance and I, well, we, we thought it was ridiculous to take five minutes sample, whatever length samples work. We were going to do a task in which everything was measured as it went along. So we had this you know, um, um, a, a device for trucking the people working on their task on a sheet. But quite good, we're using a chymograph, of course, no computers available. And we disproved uh, Phil Potts' theory, which that can't have done us in any good stead in our first year. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I got a, 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 a good degree, mainly because I say lack of negative transfer and having Henry James um, and doing statistics. And um, uh, what was I going to do? Well, what I, I had thought of doing, I, I really wanted to go into, um, I had decided I wanted to go into criminology, about which I knew nothing whatsoever, but it seemed to me the psychologists should contribute to the problems of the prison population. And I know I sent a, an application, uh, I described my interest, sent it off to the Home Office, and I just got back a um, an application form to be a, um, a, um, a, a warder. Um, and uh, I, I, I thought, no, that can't be right. So I, I tore up the application form and sent it back with a little note saying, although I'm, I'd be happy to do that, I was sort of looking further and this didn't seem to right. And then I, I got to meet people from the uh, Institute for the Scientific Treatment of Delinquency. But they were they seemed to be extreme psychoanalysts, and when I heard them talking, I thought, oh gosh, uh, they, they don't uh, I, I know I was, I was not an, an in, entirely antagonistic to psychoanalysis, but I couldn't imagine. And so uh, then at that time it was suggested that I might apply for a, um, I don't know how exactly it happened, but uh, to put in for a Fulbright scholarship, and that I got and I, I I had various places I could go to. I could go to, um, I think, McGill. Harvard was another one. But my uh, Roger Russell had a friend who was in Washington State College, um, and uh, it had the advantage that um, it would provide employment for my wife because I'd married uh, just uh, more or less at the end of my degree course. And that was an important consideration of having fun. So, so uh, that's how I went over there. And uh, um, I, uh, I, be, I was the research assistant of a comparative psychologist because I, I was drifting in the comparative direction. And the chap, it's a very interesting introduction to psych, comparative psychology because I, I found myself working on pigs, salmon, and cockroaches. Um, uh, I was using cockroaches because I, I had this crazy idea, well, if I was going to study learning, I'd, I'd get these huge samples and I'd get probabilities of whatever they were doing and I, w I would then understand uh, the nature of learning. Uh, foolish ideas one has. And, of course, occasionally uh, one's, one's, one was breeding cockroaches and... Uh, and I'm I'm really not I'm really very good with creatures really I'm, I'm entirely unsuitable for comparative work I think and occasionally my cockroaches would escape and uh, I'd have to capture them um, and which is is easier than thought because you can you know, if you squirt 
um, uh, oxygen at them, it slows them down because they. So uh, that that wasn't too bad. In in the my boss was working on projects in, in on the migration of salmon, uh, which was really very interesting. But my main task there was to keep salmon fry alive in refrigerated systems, and so I was a kind of refrigeration engineer. And these were old gas refrigerators which broke down and started poisoning everybody from time to time, so I had to rush in and repair them. And then finally, uh, with pigs, I uh, was doing, uh, this was really, uh, uh, he was doing an experiment on dominance in pigs, and uh, um, uh, so we had a set of uh, sows, and uh, my main task was to inject some of them with uh, testosterone and to see what effect this had on dominance. Um, uh, injecting pigs is quite a, if you consider the nature of their skins, it's quite a challenge. But I did, they were very friendly because I used to feed them. They, they, so they loved me in spite of this treatment. But I did discover in carrying out this work, uh, uh, an important economic principle because in testing dominance, what happened is that uh, the, the animals were pre trained to press a, uh, a plate and then get a pellet. And eventually the plate and the pellet were, and the delivery device were separated in here. And um, if you had a dominant pig and a passive pig, the net result was that the dominant pig did all the pressing and the passive pig did all the eating. That may sound uh, a weird macroeconomic <laughs> principle, but microeconomics revealed uh, that the, the reason was if a passive pig pressed the bar, it could never get near the food at all, so it extinguished very quickly. Whereas a dominant pig could press a large number of times and pound over and uh, <laughs> squash the little pig so that uh, the, the little pig was quite happy, really. <laughs> so but I've never seen this written up anywhere because <laughs> I, and my, um, there was one other minor point at that time. Uh, uh, it was a weird time in America because it was the McCarthy era. And there were conflicts even inside the department between those who were left-leaning. And uh, you got some rather nasty uh, uh, things there. But I, I made some very good friends. And uh, um, I'm trying to think of something. Oh, yes. I did go to my first um, scientific meeting. But I think it was the Western Psychological Association were meeting in... Uh, Seattle, I think, and I, I gave a paper there uh, explaining what I was trying to do with my uh, my um, cockroaches, and um, amongst the audience were, uh, were uh, Tolman and uh, Guthrie, uh, leading uh, animal learning theorists of the time, and Tolman came up and said how much he'd enjoyed my paper, which was you know, rather made me feel rather good. The, the only thing about going to this, um, it was a, it was a, a not a good place to go to, to uh, as a graduate student, because in the American system you have your coursework over a certain period, and then you do your um, uh, actual experimental work later, really. But. Uh, I, I'm not trying to boast because I think it would have happened to any British student coming to America that in, in spite of not having been taught psychology in America at the undergraduate level, um, I knew more about psychology, even American psychology, than they did. And uh, the, the, um, the department was very surprised that I knew about Guthrie and what he was doing. And uh, so um, it, it just didn't seem that I, 
I was going to get anywhere there. But we were all, we were all very friendly, but so we more or less accepted it as such. Uh, and so I came back after the end of one year to UC, where I had a university studentship, and then I began to work on my own programme. Absolutely fascinating. Thanks for sharing that, Bob.